Welcome to Creating Connection with me, your host, Dr. T, where we will navigate being human together. We'll do this through conversations, exploring the challenges and joys of life, uncovering insights and strategies to create meaningful connections, to foster personal growth and find solace in the collective wisdom of our diverse community. Drawing from a unique blend of academic expertise and personal experiences, I will dive into the joys and complexities of aging, death, dying, grief, and body image with a blend of humor and compassion and understanding, we will forge connections that transcend geographical boundaries and unite us in our shared humanity. When we come together, the possibilities are endless. Creating connection with me, Dr. T, starts now. Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Dr. T, and you are listening to Creating Connection on Transformation Talk Radio. Stay with me for the next hour as I share two pillars of my practice. Um, they're ones that support my path, and they are self-compassion and gratitude. I'm going to talk about self-compassion first. That can be a bit trickier to wrap um, your mind around, especially if you're used to being in a habit kind of pattern of beating yourself up. Um, I'll start with the benefits of self-compassion. So self if you have self-compassion, uh, the benefits are less depression, less anxiety, less stress, and less shame. And the benefits are more happiness, more life satisfaction, more self-confidence, and more physical health. And these are research-based. So everything that I'm talking to you about today, um, I will be sharing my experiences with these practices, but I'll, I'll also be bringing up the research that supports these practices. And um, as always, I will have a list of references or recommended reading at the bottom of the show notes. Um, I'm so glad you're here. So I'll start with a little gratitude first. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Um, and going back to self-compassion. Um, years ago, I realized that I was talking to myself in a way that I wouldn't talk to anyone, a friend, a stranger, someone I really, really didn't like. And the things my internal dialogue about um, at that time, it was about my weight and, you know, what I was doing for work or not doing or education, all of those things. And I realized this and um and it actually, it was like that instant awareness, uh, wake up call of like, why, why would I talk to myself this way? So I started shifting that. So the first thing is becoming aware of how you talk to yourself. So self-awareness really does tie into self-compassion and gratitude. So these are kind of mindfulness practices. I didn't know that that's what I was starting all those years ago when I recognized that negative habit loop of talking to myself um, in really <laughs> demeaning and damaging ways. And it didn't happen overnight. The changes did not happen overnight. Uh, and what was funny and interesting is, you know, fast forward several decades later, uh, several, I don't know, math, you know. Um, so, I, but, I, but a good, maybe 20 years later, um, and I realized that I had helped my self-talk. I was, you know, being much more compassionate in my internal dialogue. Great. That was awesome. Um, however, I started projecting and thinking like, oh, that person thinks this about me or, oh, that person must think this about me, which was really interesting because of course they're still my thoughts, but I was just projecting outward. So then I got to work with that. So there are many layers to this and there's many messages in the world of why we shouldn't feel good about ourselves and you know what what we need to do in order to be perfectly perfect so that we can feel good about ourselves. And I'm here to say that you can start where you are, right here, right now, um, with some self-awareness. So I gave you a little bit of the background of what you can get with self-compassion, but how do you start putting that into practice? Well, for me, it was that recognizing that I would never talk to another person the way I was talking to myself. So something you could say or start to think about is, um, how would you treat a friend if they came to you with the same situation, the same worries, the same fears? Um, you can also take self-compassion breaks where you actually pause and you know send yourself some kindness 
You can explore this through writing. If you're a journaler, um, I do journal uh, most days and I find that very helpful. And so you can start thinking about like how you talk to yourself that way. Um, and then, you know, just see if you can invite yourself to be a compassionate observer of what is going on in your life, um, shifting your critical self-talk and then noticing if you start projecting it to other people like I did. Um, and so in order to do that, we need to get past some myths. So often, and, and you know, I'm when I'm interacting with people and talking about these things, like in a group setting, I ask them, you know, when I say the word self-compassion, what does that mean to you or what comes up for you? Um, because we can't do that. We're not in dialogue right now. I'd like you to think about that for sure. Um, but I'll also address some myths. Um, so Kristen Neff, K-R-I-S-T-I-N, Neff, N-E-F-F, -F, and Christopher Germer, um, his last name is G-E-R-M-E-R, -E they are prolific researchers on mindful self-compassion. They have books, they have um, great resources on their um, website, so I encourage you to check it out. And again, they're listed in the notes, but they talk about the five myths of self-compassion. Often people think that self-compassion is a form of self-pity, which in fact, it's actually the antidote to, um, to anything that's going on because people who practice self-compassion then are more willing to accept um, experiences and acknowledge difficult feelings with kindness. So if you, if you think about it, you know, they're not in the woe is me, but they're like, oh yeah, this is hard. Or, you know, I, I, this is something I'm struggling with and you acknowledge it, which gives you that space. Cause sometimes when you get into the self-pity loop, you can actually just keep ruminating and spinning out really. Um, another myth that comes up is people think that self-compassion is weakness. It's actually been shown to be an important source of coping and resilience. And a quote from their book is, it's not just what we face in life, but how we relate to ourselves when the going gets tough. Are you an inner ally or an inner enemy? And this then determines the ability to get through tough situations successfully. So again, you know, thinking about, you know, making friends with yourself or your own experience, how would you talk to a friend and turning that towards yourself, which then you're, you're giving yourself an ally. You are, you're not all warring against yourself as you're going through already a tough time. Uh, other people have said that they're worried that if they practice self-compassion, it will make them complacent. And it's not just about self-acceptance. It, it also involves taking action. So again, you know, kind of thinking about that spinning out that might happen if you're beating yourself up, your focus really narrows and it's like, oh, you know, all you can think about is how, you know, you messed up a situation or how awful this or that is. Um, it actually helps you pause and then take action because when you give yourself kindness when you work with that like as you are a friend then you start seeing possibilities like oh well maybe i could try this or maybe this would help um versus getting stuck in that habit loop of kind of negativity um <clears throat> another uh myth is that people think that self-compassion is selfish um, and being good to yourself actually gives you the emotional resources to be good to others and you might even think of a time where maybe you've been stuck in some judgment or beating yourself up. It's kind of hard to think of other people in those moments, right? Like it's, you know, you're just so like down that path of, you know, recrimination or, you know, uh, beating yourself up that, you know, you can't really see other people. So it does actually give you the emotional resources to be good to others. Um, and then lastly, one of the major myths about self-compassion is being um, that people think that self-compassion is being indulgent. Um, and I loved this quote, self-compassion has its eye on the prize, the alleviation of suffering. That's the prize. Self-indulgence involves giving ourselves short-term pleasure at the cost of long-term harm. 
I'm going to read that again. Self-indulgence involves giving ourselves short-term pleasure at the cost of long-term harm. And um, the notation that I have in the book when I read that is a curse word starting with an F. Um, and I, it just struck me so strongly that, um, you know, we think that we'll be self-indulgent, like, oh, like if I feel bad and, you know, I'm just going to coddle myself. But actually... That is the opposite, because again, it's not about complacency, right? It's also about taking action. So if there's something that you're feeling badly about and you can meet that with like tenderness and compassion, then you start seeing the possibilities of, of things. And then there's an action step. And it's not just about, you know, hiding under the covers or um, grabbing out that ice cream. But of course, you know, if you listen to the mindful eating episode, I believe that was episode five. Um, you know, I, I also think that, you know, you can eat whatever you want and just be mindful about it. OK, um, so self and self um, self compassion um, has three components. And again, as I'm talking about these things, it is research based. But the best thing is always to investigate it for yourself. This is not just like I'm telling you this. It's like, oh, you know, take it on, you know, start pausing, noticing yourself, talk, noticing any resistance you might have about being nice to yourself or kind to yourself. And the three components that um, Kristen Neff and Christopher Grummer um, came, you know, kind of their framework is that self-compassion involves three main things, self-kindness, common humanity, and mindfulness. So self-kindness is being supportive and encouraging. Um, you're actually aiming to protect yourself from harm, and that includes inner harm, right? That includes that kind of inner narrative or that inner bully. Um, and self-kindness also includes the wish and effort to alleviate suffering. So if there's something that is painful for you um, and you're suffering about it, um, self-kindness actually can help you um, alleviate that. And again, suffering, and you might notice this for yourself, but when I am in suffering, it's usually when I'm thinking about the past and wishing things were different, or I'm worried about the future. And that causes kind of that moment of, of suffering or many moments of suffering. And when you are in the present, you know, which is, you know, here and now often, even in the midst of, you know, really hard things, um, you might not be suffering, right? Um, that's a bigger conversation. <laughs> you know, contact me. We can we can do a deep dive. Um, the next component of self compassion is recognizing common humanity, seeing our imperfections as part of the larger human experience, and recognizing that everyone suffers. So you know, if you make a mistake, there's you know what. Uh, how many people on the planet now? Eight billion. Um, chances are someone else has, you know, made a mistake in the same way that you have, or they've um, struggled with something that you are currently struggling with. And it's not that you're wishing those struggles on other people, but rather it's um, kind of recognizing like, oh, my situation isn't unique and I can give myself compassion because I am also human. Um, I don't know about you, but I often, um, <laughs> I often think I have the most generosity and compassion for people when they're sharing about things that they're worried about or that they think they've messed up on. But somehow I hold myself to a different standard and I don't know why that is. Um, so this stepping back and recognizing that there's common humanity here. Um, I've, I'm I am struggling with this, but I am not the only person on the planet who has ever had this struggle or is even currently struggling with that. And then mindfulness is the third component. Um, so again, as I started out, you know, it's, it's about awareness and it's also being with things as they are. So it is noticing the negative self-talk, but then also being with things as they are. So as I mentioned, you know, my self-talk was really surrounding um, my weight at the time I had, I had gained weight. So I've been up and down and up and down. Um, and 
And at that time, when I recognized it in my late mid to late twenties, whenever that was, um, I was beating myself up. I'd wake up, I'd wish things were different. I'd feel discouraged. I'd, you know, eat more, you know, like another candy bar for that temporary self-indulgent quick fix. Um, I didn't actually want to be with things as they were, right? Like I wanted to be like I was in my teens and early twenties. And so my suffering was wishing things were different. Um, so I started with the awareness of the self-talk, <laughs> the body friendliness. Um, you know, that's a journey that keeps happening. I'm, I'm much farther along with, um, befriending my body and I am happy to report that, but that, that did not happen overnight. And so being with things as they are, but then it's also then that action piece, right? So, if I notice that my, you know, joints are stiff or that I am holding excess weight, then if I do that with compassion and not judgment and beating myself up, I can take action. I am able to because I'm coming from a place of kindness and I'm coming from a place of real care for this container that I'm in. Um, so that might mean, you know, going for a walk or doing um, supernatural um, workouts. I love doing those on the VR check it out if you're interested in a fun workout. Anyway, so it's not about, and I used to do workouts as punishment, right? I ate a Snickers bar, it's X amount of calories. So then I have to do X amount of time on the treadmill um, or like, oh, punitive, um, punitive language. So right now I want to take care of my body. I want to age as well as I can. I don't, there's not a lot of things I have control over, you know, as I age. But there are certain things that I do, being kind to myself, noticing and recognizing what my body needs, and then being friendly about it and not um, kind of a bully. So that is self-compassion. And um, with self-compassion, it ties for me into um, gratitude practices. So a little bit, I want to say about gratitude, it is everywhere. You are likely to see gratitude journals. People might tell you, oh, write 10 things that you feel grateful for or five or three or whatever. Um, and that is great. Um, there, There is research that supports gratitude practices. However, we kind of get past it and we just start listing like, you know, like what, what good happened. And if I can't think of anything good that happened, then there's another reason to beat myself up because, you know, what's wrong with me? There's so much suffering in the world and I can't find something to be grateful for. So it's not about um, adding to A, a list of things to do or B, a way to, you know, make you feel bad about yourself. And also gratitude, um, the mind knows when you're kind of BSing it, right? Like, like if you're like, oh, like things are great. Yes, you know, fake it till you make it. And there's, you know, things all about that. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about like genuine um, awareness of your current experience that can uh, bring gratitude to mind. Sorry, I had to clear my throat there. Um, and so gratitude. So again, um, as a practice, you might see it. You might even be like, Ugh, don't talk to me about gratitude. And I get that. That has been something that I've also had to work with, right? Like, how can I incorporate gratitude knowing that it is a supportive practice, um, but also so that it's genuine and that I understand Um kind of where it's coming from. So my personal practice um, for, for decades, and I, again, don't know where this came from, um, but I started saying this phrase and I'll share it with you now because it's been uh, really supportive for me. And so what I say um, is for all that I've received and all that I'm about to receive, thank you. And I, say this daily. I say this when I'm struggling. I say this when I'm happy. And it actually helps then to remind me that I, I, I am very privileged. I have a lot to be thankful for in my life. And it also opens up for 
you know, whatever is coming my way that, you know, I'm about to receive. And then that thank you at the end um, is, is a, you know, sometimes I'm like, who am I thanking? And, you know, whoever you're thanking, um, it just feels really lovely. And so that, that can shift your mood. It can shift your attitude just to, you know, kind of feel grateful or allow that appreciation in your life. I also, um, I'll put this on social media later. I draw a little stick figure um, and I, you know, I write guided, grounded, and grateful. So, you know, I do feel guided in my life and then it reminds me to stay grounded and always grateful. So those are my practices that I do pretty much on the regular. Like if you looked at any of my uh, art or paintings, you know, my little stick figure is around um, in most of them. So those are my practices, but also informal meditation. So informal meditation, I talked about a lot in episode two. So that is paying attention on purpose in the present moment without judgment. So if you're doing the dishes or if you're doing laundry, you can actually start slowing down and paying attention. And for me, then organically things come up like, I'm doing the dishes. Maybe it's not my favorite task. However, if I'm really pausing and thinking, I'm like, wow, okay, I have hot running water. I have soap. I had food to put on dishes that now need cleaning. Same thing with laundry. I have clothes that I am able to take care of in my own home and, um, and you know, folding them, drying them, and the conveniences of the washer dryer that I have. Mindful eating, I talked about um, in, in episode five, and that is pausing and paying attention to the food that's in front of you. Um, today, I ate cereal for breakfast and I took a mindful bite or two. And then where my mind goes is the interconnectedness, right? The um, the how how many steps and people and processes did it take to get that check cereal in my bowl and the milk um, that I used? So, so pausing, paying attention, that can actually organically bring gratitude. Um, and, you know, even in the midst of really terrible things, like when my husband was in the hospital, um, in 2019 and it was you know serious uh accident um i wasn't grateful that he was hurt but i was very grateful for my mindfulness practice i was so so thankful that we had um medical and health insurance so there were there were pieces in the and obviously i was really grateful that he was okay but there was moments even in the fear and even in the worry and the distress that i could find those through lines of genuine gratitude so gratitude is please nothing to be forced please 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 don't uh, make this something that you're feeling bad about you know, or adding to your list is is making you feel crappy because then that goes back to self-compassion, right? So we want to alleviate suffering. We want to bring about kind of those good um, supportive practices that actually help you have a better quality of life. And so uh, another book that I reference in the um in the reference section or the recommended reading is Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle. And it's by the Nagoski sisters. And they talk about gratitude in there. And they also talk about research, right? And and again, um, they looked at what did the research actually say? What are the practices that support um, bringing more gratitude and awareness into your life. So there's one that's a short-term fix. Um, and that is simply to take 10 seconds or more to remember some of the people who have made an impact in your life. And they include a Mr. Rogers quote. Think of the people that helped you love the good that grows within you. Some of the people who have loved us and want what's best for us, those who have encouraged us to be who we are. And that's the the practice, right? So taking some time to, to think about, you know, who's made an impact, who's encouraged you, who's loved you. Um, this could also be a pet or um, another being in your life. Um, you could write a letter if you wanted to take it that next level, you know, a card or a letter, you could send it or not send it. And 
pay attention too to this because I, I you know, on um, this past Monday meditation, we did this practice together and just be aware that it might bring up grief, especially if those important people or beings are no longer with you. Um, you know, pro tip, you can still write a letter, um, even if they're not here to receive it. It is a helpful practice that I do as well, um, you know, to to write out all the things that um, that person meant to me. So that also is a grief practice that I do, but it, it can be with this gratitude. So be aware of that if you're if you take on that action step to try the short term fix of bringing in these people who have made such an impact in your life. The next practice is um, for a long-term gratitude boost. And research says, you know, to at the end of the day, think of an event or circumstance for which you feel grateful. And don't just stop there. So don't just say, oh, you know, um, I... <laughs> Um, I'm grateful for the support that I get to produce this show. Um, it, it, you would actually want to title it. You'd want to get into the details of what happened, um, describe how it made you feel, and then I, actually how you feel now as you think about it and reflect on it. And, and then even explain how the event came to be. So you're really getting into detail and noticing, you know, what were the circumstances? How do you feel now? Um, and, and getting into it. Um, so the research <laughs> recommendation um, or what they, they had found evidence for this being a um, practice that is helpful and makes a, a, a longer term impact so it said to um, do to write down three events with that level of detail every day for at least a week. Um, Emily, who did this practice, um, she's one of the Nagaski sisters. She, you know, thought three events uh, per day was too much, too much. So she made it her own practice and she did one event every day for three weeks. So again, with any of the practices or things or action items or anything that I talk about here on creating connection, I want you to make them your own. You know, this isn't, I, I can fall into the trap for myself of like, I want to do it the right way. Um, but what I liked about this um, section of their book is they, you know, they were like, well, you know, I didn't want to do three events uh, for per day for a week. And so they made it their own practice. So with anything, um, you want to make these practices your own. And what it does is it actually trains the brain to notice not just positive events, but the personal strengths that it took to create those events and also the external resources that you have access to. And so you're you're really looking at all of those kind of bigger picture things and it starts training your brain. And I think for me, um, you know, saying my, you know, for all that I've received and all that I'm about to receive, thank you, um, that helps train my brain. There's moments where I'm just, you know, kind of stunned at the the abundance I have in my life. And and that might just be watching my husband cooking in the kitchen. And I'm I'm just like, wow, how did I get here? And this is so amazing. And it it really it's um humbling and beautiful when you start to pause and pay attention to those things that make a difference in your life. So again, these two practices, you know, are can promote well-being connection, focus on the presence, um, increase resilience, and um, also kind of re um, another path using mindfulness. So to get that into your, into your daily practice. And, you know, for mindfulness, I just want to say a note about practicing mindfulness. Um, you know, we don't practice it for the sake of becoming good meditationers, you know, like, oh, I can sit very still for this amount of time. Um, what it actually does is it lends us to have practice um, for the things in our life, right? So for the um, moments that are tough. And when you're dealing with those, if you already have a mindfulness practice, then, you know, your kind of your habit pattern would be go to go to that you know, taking a deep breath if something's hard. So again, these are all just practices. And I like to say it's a practice, not a perfect. So what I am going to do now, um, 
is I'm going to lead a longer meditation. So I've been doing some short eight to 10 minute meditations. This will be about a maybe 25 minute meditation to maybe even 30 minutes. What I'm going to lead is a compassionate body scan. And so if you're not in a place to do that, just listen along. Or if you'd like to practice, you know, kind of making your your way and and being aware that um, I will be leading a longer meditation with you all. And I hope that it is a great resource for you. Um, And so, and also, you know, don't beat yourself up, don't judge yourself or don't go like, oh, 30 minute practice, I'm not doing it. Just give it a try and, and see how it goes. So Sierra, whenever you're ready, I'll have you start rolling those images and I'll Um, I'm not going to be on camera. I'm going to have images playing. And um, these are all photos that I've taken and nature. So if you have your eyes open, I hope you enjoy those. So just taking a couple of moments to get settled. In this meditation, we'll be bringing warm-hearted attention to each part of the body, moving from one part to the other, practicing how to be with each part of the body, and doing this in a kind and compassionate way. So taking the time to incline the awareness towards the body with curiosity and friendliness, Uh, perhaps even how you might bring your attention to a small child or a friend. And while we're going through the practice, if you feel at ease and well and well in a particular body part, you can invite some gratitude or appreciation, just allowing it to arise towards that part of the body. If you have judgments or unpleasant sensations regarding a body part, perhaps you can let your heart kind of soften in tenderness and maybe even empathy for the struggle that the body is having in that area. And if any area of the body is too difficult to stay with, please feel free to move your attention to another body part for a while, especially a body part that is emotionally or physically neutral. This could even be the breath. Just allowing this meditation to be as comfortable as possible. Stay in touch with what you need moment to moment and really make this practice your own. So as you feel ready, find a comfortable position. Resting on your back, you can do this, well, you can do this laying down or sitting up, whatever feels most comfortable. But really, you know, if, if possible, rest on your back with your hands about six inches from your sides and your feet shoulder width apart using a bolster if you need it. And again, making yourself comfortable, getting a blanket. So getting yourself situated so that you can be alert and at ease during this practice. It might even be helpful to place a hand or two on the heart center, you know, doing this as a reminder to bring loving connected presence to your body throughout the practice. Just letting yourself feel the warmth and gentle touch of your hands. taking three slow, relaxing breaths. So breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth. Doing that again, deep breath in through the nose and out through the mouth. One more time, deep breath in and exhale. You can then return your arms to the sides if they've been on the heart center. I'd like to invite you to bring the attention to your toes. All the way down to the toes. See if you can notice if there's any sensations in the toes. Are they warm or cool? Dry? Damp? Just feel the sensations in the toes, noticing if there's ease, discomfort. Perhaps you're not feeling anything in the toes, and what is that like to notice? Like, oh, 
I don't feel anything here. Let each sensation just be as it is. Again, you're not trying to change anything. You're not trying to make anything different. You're just paying attention to the body as it is. And if the toes feel good, again, you know, maybe giving them a little wiggle and a smile of appreciation if that's in your practice. Moving the attention now to the soles of the feet. Are you able to detect any sensations there? Is the right foot different from the left foot? The feet have such a small surface area, yet they hold up the entire body all day long. They work so hard. Feel free to send the souls a little bit of gratitude if that feels okay to you right now. And if there's discomfort, Again, offering kindness or friendliness, sympathy, empathy to that part of the body. Now bringing the attention to the whole of the feet. So the whole foot, um, whole feet. If the feet feel comfortable, you can also extend gratitude for the discomfort you don't have. If there is any discomfort, allow that area to soften. Maybe even imagining the feet wrapped in a warm towel. You can even validate the discomfort with kind words, saying something like, there's discomfort here and it's okay for now. And notice if the mind wants to get caught up in stories so gently, anytime the mind wanders, it's what the mind does, no worries at all. Gently bringing the attention back to the area of the body and focusing on that. And again, if that area is challenging for you, taking a break and focusing on the breath. Just staying here in as much kindness um, as you can with this container of yours. Gradually move the attention up the legs, noticing whatever body sensations are present, sending appreciation if the part feels fine, and compassion if there's any discomfort. So moving the attention slowly through the body to the ankles, these joints often, you know, maybe there's some issues here. It's okay, giving it and sending it a little appreciation for all that they do, the ankles. Moving the attention now up to the calves and shins, the muscles in this area. Slowly moving the attention up to the knees, another area of joints. <laughs> <laughs> that can be challenging or um, painful. If there are any issues or difficulty, seeing if you can offer, again, that friendliness, that practice of compassion, like, oh, yeah, my knee hurts. Or um, if they feel good, you know, and it's in your practice, offering that sense of gratitude for all that the knees do. And if it's in your practice, you might want to add words of kindness or compassion. You know, you could even send a little loving kindness to the knees. May my knees be at ease. May they be well. And then return your attention to the sensations. And again, noticing if the mind gets caught up in stories and just coming back to the direct felt sensation of the body part. Pulsing, tingling, aching, neutral. Just allowing and inviting a sense of maybe um, investigation, curiosity, uh, playfulness. Just noticing what's here. Again, not trying to change anything or make anything different. Moving the attention up through uh, from the knees to the thighs the hips, big muscle groups here in this area. 
Notice if you feel uneasy or judgmental about any body part. Taking a couple of deep breaths and imagining that kindness and compassion are flowing into your body with each breath. And if that's a stretch, that's okay too. Don't judge the judging. <laughs> and if you feel at ease, again, offering that maybe inner smile or outer smile of appreciation, if that feels right to you. Again, it's about being with, noticing what's here, and seeing what arises. <clears throat> Bringing loving attention to both legs in their entirety from the hips all the way down to the toes. Making room and allowing whatever you might be sensing or feeling in this moment. Now bring awareness to the pelvic area, the strong bones here that support the legs and also the soft tissue in the pelvic area perhaps feeling the buttocks on the floor or on the chair, large muscles that help you climb stairs and also allow you to sit softly and comfortably. Again, noticing if any judgment or thoughts about this part of the body arise and just notice it. Again, you're not trying to change anything or make it different. You're simply noticing what's here. Moving the attention now to the lower back. A lot of stress might be stored here. And if you notice any discomfort or tension, you might imagine the muscles relaxing, melting, seeing if you can take a deep breath in and maybe breathe a little relaxation to that area or just invite it to relax. You might even need to notice you need to shift your, shift your posture a little bit. If an adjustment would make you more comfortable, please do that, taking care of your body through this whole practice. Moving the attention now to the upper back, the spinal column running from the base of the neck all the way to the tailbone. Just paying attention. You might even notice the breath in this area, breathing in and out. Feeling the rib cage expand and contract. Moving the attention now to the front of the body, to the abdomen. This is a complicated part of the body with so many organs and body functions. If it's in your practice, sending gratitude to this part of the body for all that it does. And if you, again, have judgments about the belly, see if you can say some words of kindness and acceptance. Moving the awareness now up to the chest, the center of your breathing, also the heart center, the place that we often feel that sense of love and compassion. Try to infuse the chest with awareness, appreciation, and acceptance. Perhaps even putting a hand to the center of the chest, allowing yourself to feel whatever it is you're feeling right now. There's so many systems here, the heart, the lungs, you know, these, these organs that without our, you know, telling them what to do, they are life-giving forces. And we are taking time now to pause and reflect on all that the body does in this part and protected by the ribs and the sternum. You might even notice the breath as it enters the body and leaves the body rise and fall of the chest. Contraction and expansion of the belly. Offering gratitude to the torso, if that feels in your practice. 
Moving the awareness now to the shoulders, upper arms and elbows. Just moving the awareness down to the lower arms, the wrist, the hands, the fingers. The arms do so much, can pull and push and hug and lift. You might even wiggle the fingers, savoring sensations that arise when they are mo in movement. There's so many um, nerve endings here and, you know, they're sensitive to touch and all that the hands allow that you to do in the day. And now moving the awareness to the head, beginning with the neck. You might even touch the neck with your hand if you'd like. And the neck does so much to support your head throughout the day, <laughs> these heavy little heads of ours. How it's a conduit for blood to the brain and air to the body. Seeing if some appreciation and kindness um, can arise towards the neck and all that it does. If the neck feels good, that's awesome. And if it feels not so great, send in compassion, especially if there's any tension or discomfort there. We often can hold a lot of tension in the neck as well. Bringing the awareness now to the head, the back of the head, the skull that protects the big, beautiful brain. You might just notice what it's like to place the attention to the back of the head. Moving the awareness to the ears. Sensitive organs of perception, they tell us so much about the world. And if you're glad that you have the capacity to hear, maybe allowing appreciation to arise. And if you're worried about your hearing, perhaps putting a hand over the heart and giving yourself some compassion. Again, this practice is about noticing what's here and working with the challenges that can arise in the body, but also offering that friendliness. And then when things are going well, that sense of appreciation and gratitude and bringing the awareness now to the other organs of perception, the eyes, nose, lips. We take in so much information through sense awareness and perception. Noticing how it feels to have the cheeks and jaw and chin relaxed. You know, this area, these small muscles in the face do so much to express emotion, to support eating, speaking, smiling, frowning. Just noticing how it feels. And if you're holding tension maybe in the forehead, um, it might be... Um, a practice to see if you can invite some relaxation to those small muscle groups in the forehead and around the eyes. And then noticing the crown of the head and underneath the brain. The brain is comprised of billions of nerve cells that are communicating with each other all the time to help you make sense of this marvelous world we live in. If you'd like, Offering some gratitude to the brain for working 24-7 on your behalf. And now taking in the body as a whole. Wandering the attention from the crown of the head all the way down to the toes. So from the crown of the head through the face, back of the head, the neck, the shoulders, all the way down to the fingertips, the torso, the hips, buttocks, thighs, knees, calves, shins, ankles, all the way down the soles of the feet to the toes. 
And just taking a moment to hold your whole container in awareness, seeing if there's a gratitude that arises for all that it helps you experience in the world, and also compassion if there's challenges. As you feel ready, maybe bringing some gentle movement, wiggling the toes, maybe wiggling the fingers, taking a stretch if that feels good. And taking a couple of deep breaths and allowing yourself to become aware of the room that you're in. And opening the eyes if they've been closed. Thank you so much for your practice. All right, as we come to the end of this episode on creating connection, um, I'd like to leave with a couple closing messages. Um, so again, as always, I try to have action items. Um, so for this week, uh, trying the short and long-term gratitude practices, remembering that the short is taking some time to think about the people in your life, or beings, people or beings past or present who have made a difference in your life. And the next level up would be writing them a letter of appreciation, sending it or not. The long-term practice again is at the end of each day, thinking of an event or situation that you feel grateful about and writing about it, giving it a title, writing down what happened, describing how it made you feel at the time and how it makes you feel as you think about it, and then even explaining how the situation or event came to be. Practicing the compassionate body scan. Um, you can rewind and do the that if it was supportive for you. I hope that it was. And each week, you can join me for a free live guided meditation on Zoom on Mondays. They are at 1 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Central, 10 a.m. Pacific. And you can go to my website, CC with Dr. T to res <laughs> CC with Dr. T.com to reserve your spot. Again, that's CC with Dr. T.com to reserve your spot. And this is kind of fun, uh, not kind of, it's very fun. I'll be on the Dr. Pat show um, here on the Transformation Talk Radio this uh, coming Monday. So Monday, January 22nd, and that is at 11 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Central. And we will be talking about mindful aging. So I'm really excited to be on her show and connect with her community I, I, this has been a gratitude, gratitude um, show. And so I do want to thank you all for tuning in to creating connection with Dr. T. I am really grateful that you chose to spend your time with me today. Please reach out with any questions or comments and show ideas. Um, also, it does help me if you share the show and join me. Um, I'm here on the first and third Wednesdays of every month at 1 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Central, 10 a.m. Pacific time. And until then, take good care of yourself and others. I'll see you back here February 7th, uh, and we'll be joined by my dear friend, Wade Maggart. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Creating Connection with me, Dr. T. You can join me by tuning in on the first and third Wednesdays every month at 10 a.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com, where we will navigate being human together. Being human means that we all have a body and we will all experience loss, grief, and aging if we're lucky. Let's join together on this journey of exploration, support, and mutual learning. I love bringing people together and on Creating Connection, we are a conversation away from understanding another person and quite frankly, ourselves. For more information, visit ccwithdrt.com.